You're listening to the Mezzo Guild podcast. Language learning made simple. If you're a regular reader of my blog, then you know that my background for the last 12 or so years has been in Egyptian Arabic, and to a lesser extent Levantine and Iraqi Arabic. A while ago, I mentioned that I had a plan, though, to drastically improve my Moroccan Arabic. But Moroccan has always been a big challenge of mine. Spending a lot of time in the Gulf region, in Qatar and Dubai especially, this past uh, 12 months, the past two years really, I've met a lot of Moroccans and a lot of Tunisians uh, living there for work. Uh, and, and by interacting with them, I've, le- I've learned a lot about the differences uh, between the different dialects and various strategies for communicating. Usually this would entail me speaking Egyptian to the Moroccans and Tunisians and them replying to me in their dialect or a slightly uh, Egyptianized version of their dialect to make it easier for me to understand. Therefore, I saw a real need to start spending some serious time focusing on Maghrebi Arabic, that's Moroccan, Algerian, Tunisian, Libyan, to get, uh, to get my, my Maghrebi Arabic up to a more competent level, or at least my comprehension, since a lot of the work I do these days requires me to speak with people from these places. Honestly, I, I have no desire to speak Moroccan Arabic, no desire to speak it. I speak Egyptian Arabic, I speak Levantine pretty well. Uh, I really don't have any desire to actually speak Moroccan Arabic. What's important to me, however, are my listening comprehension skills in in Moroccan Arabic, to understand what I hear. Since Moroccans can understand Egyptian Arabic because of the media, because of uh, movies and so on, my, my main priority has simply been to make sure that I can understand them when they answer me. Now, if you ask anybody with even a rudimentary knowledge of Arabic about Moroccan, they'll tell you that it's like learning a totally different language. It's not even like a dialect to some people. They just see it. It's like a a completely different language. It's so hard to understand. Even native Arabic speakers from the Middle East and Egypt can seriously struggle to understand a speaker from Northwest Africa. This is probably why it's one of the least desirable dialects to learn. In my experience, from what I've seen, uh, from what I've what I've heard from people, it seems to be one of the least desirable dialects because it's the most geographically limiting variety of Arabic. It's geographically limiting. Because of this, many argue that it shouldn't even be classified as a dialect. Now, the easiest way to understand this argument is to compare it to Portuguese and Spanish, which are very similar and yet two completely different languages. Now, I'm personally undecided as to how I would classify it. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to share with you just a few observations that I've made about Moroccan from the perspective of someone who uh, has been learning Egyptian, Levantine, and Iraqi for over a decade. Okay, this is just uh, some of the things that I have learned, some of the things I've observed. Now, I'm definitely not an expert on Moroccan Arabic, but some of the observations that I've made may help you if you're in a similar situation or considering which one to learn. So the first observation that I made is that Moroccan pronunciation takes a lot of getting used to. Now, when I first sat down and started listening carefully to Moroccan material, I was really disheartened. It just sounded like a totally foreign language. I could recognize a few words and expressions here and there. They sort of pop out, but they were lost in this sea of gibberish that I just couldn't understand. Here and there, you'd get a French word that would jump out at you, uh, but none of this was enough for me to really decipher what was being said. Some of the letters, in particular the strange gutturals, uh, just didn't sound familiar either. Now, here's what I started to realize. Like every dialect variation of Arabic, there are significant vowel shifts that make a very common Arabic word totally unrecognizable at first sound. So the first time you hear it, you, you might think, man, that is a totally foreign word. I've never heard that word before. But it, in actual fact, you, you're hearing a word that's common, but the vowel shifts make it sound totally different. So as a simple example, if you take the word in Arabic for dog, kalb, across all the different dialects of Arabic and all of the little, uh, the, the regional variations, you will actually hear this pronounced a whole lot of different ways, kalb, kelb, kilb, uh, or even kelb. 
So it's the same word, the same consonants. Uh, if you look at it uh, written down on paper, it's exactly the same thing. But the difference is that it's undergone vowel changes over time in different places. Now, when you hear this spoken in a sentence at normal speed, surrounded by other words, it can be very hard to hear if you're not used to that particular vowel change. So for me personally, since Egyptian is my forte, my strongest dialect, when I meet somebody, uh, when I meet a Levantine or an Iraqi speaker, I'll usually have to make a mental adjustment at first to prepare myself for the many words that I'll use, uh, which have slightly different vowel sounds, but the same consonants. And this is no different to English either. If you consider the way that British and American people say the word banana, for example, uh, in America, they say banana. In the UK or in Australia, they say banana, 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 banana. They're the same consonants, B, N, B and N, uh, or B double N, uh, but the vowel change makes it sound like a totally different word to a learner of English. The issue with Moroccan does get a little more tricky, though, than this, in my opinion. And this is because of odd consonant clusters that you get due to short vowels, uh, which actually drop out of the words alt altogether. So if you take a word like balad, balad in Arabic, which means uh, country, um, it sounds very much the same in most dialects. But in, in Moroccan, it sounds like bled, bled. So balad, like B-A-L-A-D, sounds like bled when a Moroccan says it. The short vowel in the first syllable just disappears. Uh, and this means that in the context of a full sentence, it, it sounds like a really different word. It sounds totally different. And then you look at uh, personal pronouns, for example, like enter, enti. They sound more like nta, nti. So the, it kind of it cuts off that vowel in the beginning. So it's like nta, nta, nti. And then the, uh, the definite article, al or il, uh, actually sounds more like le. So um, the, the initial vowel actually drops. But this could also be because of the French influence in the definite article, which, which is the same in French. So you encounter these, uh, these bizarre sort of vowel changes and deletions uh, everywhere in Moroccan Arabic. And that's why it sounds so different. So what I found is that the consonant clusters caused by dropped short vowels actually make it really tricky to hear what's being said the first time around. But when you listen to it a few times... Or if you see it written down on a transcript, usually you're like, ah, I get it. Okay, I see it now. The challenge is really about tr uh, training your ears to carefully listen for the familiar consonants. Another thing that I've learned is that Moroccan Arabic grammar and syntax have basic differences to other dialects, but nothing major. So they're actually really similar. It's actually pretty much along the same lines, but there are some minor differences. Moroccan is quite different to other dialects, but it is still Arabic at its core. The general uh, structure and syntax and uh, majority of terms are the same, but once you get your head around some of the basic differences, you can move ahead easier. So here are just a few simple realizations that have helped me uh, begin to move from Egyptian to Moroccan. Uh, one is that the, uh, the typical verb conjugations, depending on gender, number, and person, are the same as the other dialects, with one notable exception that I've seen. Uh, that is that first-person singular verbs begin with a nun. So, I write is ana niktib, ana niktib. Uh, unlike other dialects where it's prefixed with an aleph, ana aktib, aktib. Instead of aktib, it's niktib. Of course, this means that it's a little confusing for third-person plural we, which in, uh, which in every other dialect has the same uh, nun prefix. But in Moroccan, it has, it's got the nun prefix plus the verb. Then it has, it has a, a suffix on it, a u suffix. So it's, it's the same prefix, but it includes a plural suffix as, as well to differentiate. The other challenge is uh, what I just mentioned before with the vowel differences with verbs, which make them harder to hear. Uh, and harder to pronounce coming from a different dialect and the occasional different vocabulary that they use. And this is something that I'm still training my ear for. The, uh, the present tense prefix is a calf, is K, rather than be, rather than a B. This is and this attaches to verbs that conjugate just like, just like all the other dialects. So you write is nta ktiktib, nta ktiktib. So enta, enta ptiktib would be in Moroccan nta ktiktib. Um, future tense is indicated by a prefixed rain, or as a standalone particle before the verb ready. So, for example, I will go 
in Moroccan Arabic is Ghadi Nimshi. Ghadi Nimshi. So instead of like uh, like in Egyptian Arabic, it's Hamshi. And a Hamshi. It's uh, in Moroccan Arabic, it's Ghadi Nimshi. So it's very, it sounds like totally different when you don't know what it is. But when you get your head around these few different, these few changes, uh, it's really not that different at all. And, uh, and also the negation, the negation works, ne- uh, negating verbs works the same way, uh, mostly the same way as Egyptian, where you have a verb which is circumfixed with a negative, in, uh, negative prefix and suffix, just like in French, where you have these negated verbs like uh, je ne sais pas. Another thing that I've learned is that you just, you really just have to accept that Berber, French and Spanish has a strong uh, influence on Moroccan Arabic. One thing that you'll hear a, a lot about Moroccan Arabic is that it's heavily influenced by French, Berber, and Spanish. In fact, if you listen to a Moroccan, Algerian, or Tunisian speaker, you will almost certainly, you will certainly hear many French words and phrases, as well as a whole lot of unfamiliar terms and expressions that are not found in or rarely heard in other dialects, including antiquated Arabic expressions. So uh, just to give you an example of uh, the French influence on Arabic, on Moroccan Arabic rather. Uh, I, I listened to this interview with this woman uh, recently on YouTube and uh, I, I noticed she, she threw this expression in. She said, C'est dommage à l'al-Maghrib. C'est dommage à l'al-Maghrib. C'est dommage in French means it's a pity. It's a shame. This is a shame. À l'al-Maghrib, which means on Morocco. So what she's done is she's taken a totally French expression and a totally Moroccan exp- uh, Arabic expression and and combine them to create this uh, this ex- this expression. I, I don't know uh, I don't know how common that particular expression is in Morocco, but it was just very interesting the way that she combined those two. It was um like like uh, you may have heard of code switching, where a bilingual person injects words and expressions into their other language. Uh, I don't think that this is, it was in this particular case, but it may have been. Uh, it may have just been an example where French. French has become such a part of the language and culture that Moroccan Arabic has absorbed it as its own, the same way that English has absorbed so many French words and expressions. Either way, you can hear the French influence very, very clearly. Now, Spanish has had a big impact on Moroccan Arabic as well. This is because of its proximity to Spain, Morocco's proximity to Spain, and the Moorish occupation of Portugal and Spain for for centuries. Now, my Spanish is not great, it's pretty terrible, actually. But two examples I know of for uh, the word uh, kitchen in, in Spanish, I think, is cocina. And in Moroccan Arabic is cuisina. And the word in Moroccan Arabic for week, as in seven days, is simana. Now, Egyptian and Levantine are also quite heavily influenced by European languages, too. But I would say that anyone with a background in French or Spanish... Uh, may actually find it easier transitioning into Moroccan Arabic first. I also know very little about the Berber languages, but I do know that Moroccan Arabic is littered with borrowings from Berber. The most well-known of these is the word for how much. In every other Arabic dialect, it's kem. Whereas in Moroccan Arabic, it's in, in Berber, it's shahal. So to ask a Moroccan how old they are, you would say shahal for umrak. Shahal for umrak. How many, it literally means how many in your life. Now, this is a similar pattern to the Arabic expression and the kamsana, which means how many years do you have? You'll also find uh, a lot of unique terms to Northwest Africa, such as uh, wecha for okay, deba for now, and juj for the number two. At the end of the day, I suggest not being put off by the different vocabulary and borrowings, but just learn them gradually as you come across them. Of course, French and Spanish might give you a leg up, but they may also be detrimental since you'll probably be tempted to use them if you get stuck. Now, if you're looking for uh, some good resources on uh, Moroccan Arabic, check out the blog post attached to this episode on my website, mezoguild.com slash Moroccan hyphen Arabic. And also check out our uh, our website called talkinarabic.com.